Life History of Bhagavan Yogiram Sarat Kumar India is known as Bharata Desam, which means the land that revels in the light of sacred wisdom. The great glory of Mother Bharat is its yielding an endless succession of saints and sages right from ancient times till today. In this Bharat, Tiruvannamalai shines bright as a great spiritual center. This city has been identified as the spiritual heart of the world by Sri Ramana Mahashi. The Arunachala mountain here is considered as Lord Shiva himself. In the beginning, this was a mountain of fire. In the course of time, this has solidified into the stone mountain that we see today and it has the fame of drawing lakhs of people to its abode, especially saints, sages and sadhaks. Among them, in recent times, three great sages had done their spiritual ministry. Sri Shashadri Swami from Kanchipuram, ever ruled by Goddess Kamakshi, Shri Ramana from Madurai, ruled by Goddess Minakshi, and Yogiram Sarutkuma from Varanasi, ruled by Kasi Visalakshi, have added more glory to this temple city. Bhagavan Shri Yogiram Sarutkuma was born on December 1st in 1918 in a small village by the name Nardara, on the banks of the river Ganga in Baliya district in Uttar Pradesh to a very pious Bhumiha Brahmin couple. Right from childhood, he loved the company of the sadhus gathered on the banks of the Ganges. He even spent nights with them. Sitting in the lap of his father, he would listen to the stories of Ramayana and Mahabharata with shining eyes. He could not bear to see the sadhus going hungry. Immediately, he would run home and take all the chapatis done by his mother, forsaking all others in the family and distribute them to the sadhus. His mother used to call him, my sadhvi child. When this little boy was studying in a school near the village, he would often seek solitude and meditate. At home, he would help his mother in house chores. One evening, when he was 12 years old, he went to draw water from a nearby well and saw a small bird perched on the edge of the well. In playful innocence, he threw the rope on the bird only to shoo the bird away, but the bird was hit and it fell dead. Ram Surat Kumar froze in shock and tried his best to revive it, but in vain. Grief-stricken, he cried and cried, not knowing what to do. For the first time, the question of birth and death arose in him. He understood in depth what was suffering and sorrow. This formed the foundation for his future father's work. After this, he began to seek solitude more and more and plunge into meditation. 
sudden, at the age of 16, he ran away from home without telling anyone, reached Kashi, and stood in the shrine of Vishwanathaji when he found the whole place filled with an effulgence and was completely lost in the experience. Afterwards, he went to Sarnath and stood near the monument where Sri Buddha gave his first teachings and had a deep experience. Yet he was able to come back home and complete his schooling. He took BA degree from Allahabad University and PT from Patna University. At this time, he acquired the guidance of Mahatma Kapadia Baba and often spent time in his company and in meditation on the banks. In the meantime, he was married to Sri Ram Ranjani Devi at the age of 21 and was leading the life of a householder. He was also working as a teacher in school. Once, Sri Kapadia Baba held his hand in his own and hailed that one day this hand would have more power than his. Once, when he was returning from Kapadia Baba's ashram, he heard a voice like an oracle which said, What you're doing is not your work. This is Vivekananda calling you. The first time, he turned around to see no one was around and then thought to himself that this was his own imagination. Another day, it happened again. He knew it was truly a call from Vivekananda himself. After that, he once again engaged himself in more rigorous sadhana. For nine years, he stopped eating cooked food and ate only green vegetables, fruits and milk. Also, every year during the celebrations of the Divine Mother called Navaratri, Bhagavan would observe rigorous regime. He would not take even water sometimes. After nine days, with a thin body, he would stagger his way to the Ganges with his students helping him. He would drink a little water and conclude his fasting. He said that the reason was to divinize his body. His sadhana tapas, the nearness of Kapadia Baba, and his growing longing for God would not allow him to stay put in the householder's life. The one goal of his life was to become one with God. He read Sri Aurobindo's book, Lights on Yoga. All put together, added oil to the divine fire of his longing for God. Aswami reached a state of mind when nothing but God became his only goal of life. He decided to take long leave from school and go to Sri Aurobindo's ashram. <laughs> Amidst a lot of crowd, he managed to board a train and sat. When the TTR came and asked for the ticket, he put his hand into his pocket for the ticket, only to find it empty. Why? There was no pocket at all. Someone had pickpocketed his money, ticket and everything. Had it happened to an ordinary person like us, we would have taken it as a bad omen and stopped continuing on the pilgrimage. But to a lofty mind like that of our Swami, it seemed like God was teaching him not to depend upon money as a strength. The fellow passengers collected some money and bought a ticket up to some station. After that, he walked a further distance and reached a school where the headmaster and the students saw his condition, collected some money, enough for him to reach Pondicherry. Just when he entered Sri Aurobindo's ashram, he felt a deep peace filling his entire being. He knew instantly that was Sri Aurobindo.
He was impressed with the way the ashram functioned under the guidance of the mother of the ashram. About 2,000 devotees were staying and working for the sake of Sri Aurobindo and the mother. After a few months there, he came to Ramana Ashram at Tiruvannamalai and began to sit before Sri Ramana Mahashi. Under the compassionate gaze of Bhagavan Sri Ramana, he had some deep spiritual experiences, but the final fulfillment was still not complete. A fellow visitor told him about the Ananda Ashram of Swami Papa Ramdas in Kerala. Upon hearing this, he felt a prompting to visit the place. Yet, even after two visits to Papa, he returned to the Himalayas. In 1950, news of the Mahasamadhi of Sri Ramana and Sri Aurobindo came as a shock. Again, a deep inner urge took him to Ananda Ashram in 1952. This time, Swami Papa Ramdas welcomed this young man of 34 years with great love as a father would welcome his long lost son. Furthermore, Papa described the intimate spiritual experiences of Ram Sarat Kumar, which no one else knew except him. Completely overwhelmed by Sri Papa's love, Sri Ram Sarat Kumar began to stay there. One day, he saw Papa initiating a lady devotee with Ram Mantra. Ram Sarat Kumar also felt an inner urge to be initiated by Sri Papa. He approached Swami Satchitananda and expressed his wish. Swamiji told him to approach Papa and ask him directly. With a smile, Papa immediately initiated Ram Sarat Kumar with the mantra Om Shri Ram J Ram J J Ram. and gave the single instruction to chant this mantra all the 24 hours of the day. This entered like a killer arrow of Sri Rama into his being and triggered him into ceaseless japa. He climbed up into the nearby Manjapati cave and plunged into ceaseless japa of Ramnam. With no thought for food or sleep, his insistent japa continued for six days and six nights. On the seventh day, the final enlightenment dawned on him. Referring to it later, he would say, This beggar passed away in 1952 and the world was created. What an instance! After which the God child in God madness stood out from the rest of the devotees. Completely lost to the world, he was caught in the grip of spells of ecstasy, singing Ram Nam, dancing, and sometimes rolling on the floor. It was difficult for other people to accept this. Swami Ramdas therefore asked him to leave the ashram saying, A domestic tree is generally found weak, but a forest tree grows strong, seasoned by rain and shine. When Papa asked, Where would you go? 
the spontaneous reply of Sri Yogi Ram Sarat Kumar from within was Dhiruvanamale. But it took seven years of wandering before he landed there. In those seven years, he wandered from Kanyakumari to the Himalayas like a mad beggar completely surrendered to the will of God. He experienced many great difficulties and was kicked out of the train for ticketless traveling in the middle of the nights. And there were days when he had to go on with no food or shelter. Later, he told his devotees, the mothers of Gujarat were especially kind to him. It is the land of Mahatma Gandhi. In Tamil Nadu, in a certain place where this beggar begged, some people set a dog upon him, causing bloody injuries all over him. In some places, they threw old and dry chapatis to him with no softening gravy to eat it with. Later, when he spoke about it, he would say with tears, Beggary should not be abolished in India like the Western countries. Right from Vedic period, great masters have come only in the form of beggars. India is the playground of great masters. Endowed with God's power, but roaming like a helpless, dirty, mad beggar. What a wondrous Leela of God. Despite all this, the wandering days helped him to learn about the weaknesses and the strengths of people and their mentality. This formed the foundation for his future father's work. <laughs> Arunachal Shiva, Arunachal Shiva, Arunachal Shiva, Arunachal Shiva, Arunachal Shiva. After seven years of wandering, in 1959, Bhagavan Yogi Ram Sarat Kumar arrived in Tiruvannamalai. Upon arriving, there was no one to give him food or shelter. In God madness, he was roaming through the streets. Some of his regular haunts were the railway station, a tree near the bus stand, the chariot mandabam, some specific places in Arunachaleshwara temple and outside some vessel shops. He began to sit under a punai tree near the railway station and do his father's work. Gradually, people began to understand that he was no common beggar. They started to come to him for solutions to their problems. Be it pouring rain or burning sun, the tree became his abode. With dirty and torn clothes hanging here and there, unkept hair, eyes blazing with divine light and a countenance of compassion, he was doing his spiritual ministry like an emperor though always referring to himself as a dirty beggar. People from all walks of life visited him. Not only high-level politicians, doctors, engineers, scientists, musicians and writers, but also the common people, who all called him lovingly Swami, Visiri Swami, which means hand fan Swami in Tamil, since he always had a handheld fan, they all came and sat at his feet. During the day, he stayed under the Purnai tree, and he would walk all the way right up to the chariot mandabam in the night, with four attendants carrying his gunny bags on their head and sleep outside the vessel shops. During these days, he was often found singing, Shri Rama, Jay Rama, and dancing in the streets ecstatically. Rama, 
Sometimes he would walk the streets shouting, Bharata Mata Ki Jai, Mahatma Gandhi Ki Jai. Seeing his appearance and behavior, the children of the streets would make fun of him saying, Madman, Madman, and throw stones at him. At that time, the anti-Hindi movement was at its peak in Tamil Nadu. Hence, the workers and mercenaries of the local politicians would chase and beat him. Just because he was a North Indian and a Hindi speaker, they tortured him in different ways. There were many times when those people tried to run a lorry or a car over him with the intention of killing him. But every time, the deity which was activating him from within also protected him. Knowing the paths he walked, the troublemakers would scatter broken little glass pieces on the floor where Swami went. Whenever Sri Yogi Swami moved about, singing and dancing in an ecstatic state, or going towards the town in the night, the soles of his feet would be cut in several places and bleed. In the beginning, Bhagavan used to go to a shop where flat puffed rice and ground nuts were being sold. He talked to the owner in Hindi. Sometimes he would also drink tea there. At that time, the aggressive Hindi agitation was going on in Tamil Nadu. One day, when our unsuspecting Swami entered the shop as usual, Two or three workers, including the shop owner, pounced on Bhagavan and bullied him, forcing him to say, Long live Tamil, which of course he willingly did, but refused when they forced him to say, Hindi down, Hindi down. His own friend turned against him and beat him. The angry group then violently dragged him to a nearby gutter and pushed him into it, threatening him again. Still, Bhagavan refused, saying, You do whatever you like with me, but this beggar will never say that. Then, these thugs proceeded to beat him right on the mouth until he fell unconscious. What cruelties man commits on man, especially such cruelties to a great Mahatma. Despite all the divine power that he possessed, without saying or doing anything, he accepted it as Father's grace. If he got some food to eat, it was Father's grace. If he didn't get any food, even for four days, it was still Father's grace. He constantly lived in a natural surrender to the will of God, with the knowledge that there is only Father's grace nothing else. Sometimes, when he was sleeping outside the vessel shop, the local radis would come and throw chili powder on his face and run away. Once, when Bhagavan was going towards the people tree near the bus stand, four rowdies surrounded him all of a sudden. They snatched away his coconut shell, his hand fan, the newspapers, and threw them all around. They would then push him around from one person to another like a ball, beating and kicking him repeatedly. At that time, twenty people were standing and watching it like a show. There were even some familiar faces among them. Yet, out of fear, nobody came forward to rescue him. Years later, when Bhagavan would speak about this, he said to Mataji, This is the world, Devaki. Do not trust anybody. Though he was injured all over the body, he took it only as a blessing from God. Let them beat. They have done their work. We shall do Father's work, is all what he said. Seventeen years passed and more and more people began to come to him at the Purnai tree. But the devotees could not sit in the pouring rain or the burning sun like he did. Hence, 
In 1976, the devotees bought a house in Samadhi Street and begged him to go stay there. Bhagavan accepted their prayer and started to live there. Yet, he did not keep anyone with him. He was like the wind that cannot be caught by the hand. Let us now listen to Devaki Mataji speak about the Sanadi Street House. When you enter Sanadi Street House, there's a veranda, a small one, L-shaped, and the long window, the long and wide window, which serves as a wall. You would see the whole window completely filled up with dry malas, so that people could not see inside. When you cross this small veranda, there's a huge wooden door, and then a very small passage, dark, because there's no window at all. Only if you open the door, the front door, there'll be some light. Now this passage leads to the inner hall, which served as Bhagwan's abode, Shri Vaikuntha, Kailash, For seventeen years, when you enter it first time, you will be in a shock. The way things would be scattered all over the place, things would seem chaotic, but there is there was a definite order in which Bhagwan had placed things. So much so, if if, say, if somebody offered to do some cleaning, Bhagwan would scream, no, 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 there is no need, because we would disturb his cosmos. There would be a heap of cigarette boxes in one place, a heap of match boxes in another place, and the newspapers all scattered around and books and books and dirty clothes turned black from brown, hanging on the nails on the wall here and there, and so many odd pieces like Pandora's box. And there is one heap of bottles, from the smallest to the biggest, all heaped up carrying different offerings, and many of them had stayed as they were for a long time. And then there would be a mud pot and an aluminium vessel, and above all, there would be seventeen photographs of his own, and what's more, the same one, hanging next to each other. There used to be small mats, not very small, but mats, torn here and there with huge holes, and so exposing the floor beneath. And there would be a lot of dust. He would have spread it there only for the visitors to be seated on that. There were more holes than mat. And then in the next bay, there would be gunny bags rolled, just two or three of them rolled into a bundle which served as his pillow. And one gunny bag spread on a cloth was his bed. Now outside in the small veranda there was a mat, again it was torn here and there. That was his 
Simhasan, that was his throne. This emperor of the whole cosmos was comfortably seated, very majestically seated on the stone mat and conducted his spiritual ministry. It is not surprising that just like bees to honey, people from all walks of life throng to Swamiji's abode, seeking his heavenly blessings. In the beginning of his Sanadi Street spiritual ministry, Bhagavan used to take the devotees inside the house. However, later on, he began to give darshan in the small veranda of his house. Whenever the devotees came, he would light a cigarette and start interacting with them. Sometimes he would smoke a full cigarette, sometimes only half. A rare few occasions, he would just light a cigarette and put it out immediately. What calculations were involved were only known to him. But when he smoked, there was neither smoke nor any smell either. Our bad karmas would get burnt up in his smoking. Our problems would be resolved. Once, when a foreigner asked him directly, Why are you smoking, Swami? He said, Before Papa Ramdas gave this madness to this beggar, this beggar never liked smoking. If anybody smoked in the same room, this beggar would vomit. He would run away from the place. But after this god madness, it was difficult for this beggar to be with people and work for them because of their dense vibrations. Hence, father said that this beggar should smoke. If there were only four people on the veranda of the house, he would call the gate boy and ask him to buy eight teas. Before the teas arrived, eight people would gather there. The tea also would not be distributed according to the order in which people were seated. He would keep one cup here, one cup there, and in a seemingly random fashion. In case anyone changed the order or disrupted what he was doing, he would get wild in anger. He might even ask us to get out and we might lose his blessings. Hilda Carlton, a spiritual head from New York with her own following, said, When Yogiram Sarat Kumar moves a teacup, either planets on the cosmic level or the events of a particular country would move too, resulting in certain definite changes. Whatever he did would be a welcome blessing. In his presence, our ego would coil up and sit in utter humility. He never bathed. Sometimes it might take one year for him to change his clothes. But has the dirt of the Ganges of purity not have the power to purify us? In the beginning, he carried a staff of peacock feathers in his hand. Bhagavan's left hand, index finger and thumb would move ceaselessly, as though in ceaseless japa. In every step that he took, Father's work was getting done. Nobody could enter his presence just like that. Even his anger was a blessing to his devotees. Both the people who had true devotion towards him and the people who had severe problems but no devotion could have easy access to his presence. But people who approached him only to test him landed in severe trouble. Even if there was a lack of people in front of him, he knew each and every one of their thoughts thoroughly. Once, in a cemetery near Ishanyamat, 
Bhagavan danced, making sounds of Lord Shiva's drum by his own mouth, jumping from one tune to another. The devotees who saw this said that it was Lord Shiva's thunder, the cosmic dance of Shiva. It was a sight for the gods which created goosebumps all over. In Sanadi Street House, people from all walks of life, from the simple and the poor, the learned, and people from the police and judiciary departments, industrialists, musicians, music directors, reputed writers, actors, actresses, scientists, sadhaks and saints, all visited him seeking his gracious blessing. Our ex-Prime Minister, Shri Mati Indra Gandhi received his blessings when she came to Tiruvannamalai. And another PM, Shri Chandresh Karji, visited Tiruvannamalai seeking his blessings. Also the Kerala Governor, Pa Ramachandran, Chief Justice of India, Dr. Justice Anand, Shri Balakrishnan and many High Court judges Higher government officials sought the fortune of his blessings. Sri Periyaswami Thuran, the chief editor of Tamil Encyclopedia, Dr. T. P. Minakshi Sundaram, the multilingual former vice chancellor of Madurai University, and the well reputed punster Sri K. V. J., were not only drawn to Bhagavan but also composed many beautiful songs on him. All the 1,024 excellent spontaneous songs of KVJ simply cascaded from him like waterfalls in Bhagavan's presence. Sri Yogiji had a close relationship with Swami Yananda Giri. Once, Sri Yananda Swami announced in front of his devotees that Yogi Ram Sarat Kumar was the reincarnation of Mahatma Kabir Das. Both the Mahatmas had played many leelas together, which are talked about joyfully by their devotees. Kanchi Paramacharya would bathe five times a day. Bhagavan rarely bathed five times in 47 years. Yet, there was such oneness in God between the two. Paramacharya had said about Yogi Ram Sarat Kumar, He is far, far above all. The Leelas played together by both of them are very interesting. Mata Amrita Ananda Mai said our Bhagavan is a great Avaduta who has come down to this world to work ceaselessly for the upliftment of the people. Puravi Palayam Koti Swami told the music director Sri Ilya Raja twice, Yogi Ram Sarat Kumar is an incarnation of God. When Sri Yogi Ram Sarat Kumar did Namaskaram to Swami Muktananda of Ganeshpuri, he stopped Sri Yogi Ram Sarat Kumar saying, you and I are one and the same. Shingeri Acharya said in appreciation, He is a great knower of God and a great sage. Between J. Krishnamurti and Sri Yogiram Sarat Kumar, there was a unique closeness. Mahatmas like Sri Satya Sai Baba and Paranu Krishna Premi kept a close friendship with Bhagavan. Sri Sri Murli Swami worships him as one of his three Guru Nathas. Music director Sri Ilya Raja, singer Sri Esudas, and writer Sri Balakumaran were famous artists and devotees of Bhagavan who also came seeking his blessings and divine presence.
Bhagavan's spiritual ministry continued in Sanadi Street House for the next 17 years. Due to a lack of proper food and ceaseless hard work, Bhagavan's health gradually declined. In 1993, he fell sick with fever. That same year, the former trustee, Sri Janadhanan, with the help of a few other devotees, bought three and a half acres of land for an ashram. With the decline of his health and becoming aware of the fragility of his body, Yoginam Sarat Kumar eventually consented to an ashram for the sake of the devotees. In November 1993, when Bhagavan became weak with sickness, there was no one to attend to him. Mahadeviki prayed so much to Swami to come and stay in Sadama house. Bhagavan agreed to come and stay at Sadama for only three days. However, his health became worse and Dr. Radha Krishnan, a neurosurgeon from Kerala, had to be called for treatment. The doctor hurried to Sadama and stayed for a week treating Swami's viral fever. Seeing the weak condition of Bhagavan's body, he prayed to Swami to stay in Sadama for the protection of, from the outside weather. The four Sadama sisters, knowing it was their great fortune, joined the prayer fervently and Bhagavan finally accepted. The spiritual ministry he did gathered such a crowd that soon his darshan had to be shifted to the ashram. On February 26, 1994, Swami Satchidananda came on invitation to the ashram and laid the foundation stone for the Pradhan Mandir. After that, Sri N.S. Mani accepted the responsibility of a trustee and looked after the construction of the buildings with the help of Bhagavan's grace. Until the Pradhan Mandir was completed, Bhagavan's darshan took place in an old darshan mandir first, then the ashram dining hall, and finally in Pradhan Mandir. In 1996, Justice Arunachalam was appointed by Bhagavan as his spiritual heir. In 1999, Bhagavan started daily sadhu bhojan and monthly free medical camp on every second Sunday for the sake of the poor people in and around the Rivanamale. That same year, he started the Ma Deviki Veda Patshala as well. From 1999, Bhagavan's health began to decline gradually. He contracted cancer in the abdomen, which began to spread fast. Even though Bhagavan never wanted allopathic treatment, he ended up accepting treatment after the pressure from devotees. A surgery took place in Dr. Ranga Bhashyam's clinic. When he had recovered a little, he returned to the ashram. But he soon fell sick and began to suffer again. With tears streaming down her face, Ma Devaki asked him, You have always labored hard only for the welfare of people, why should you suffer like this? Bhagavan said, Father is making this beggar suffer for some cosmic balance and even smiled in that weak condition. Bhagavan has given a promise to all of us saying, this beggar can do much better work without this body. On February 20th, 2001, Bhagavan left his physical body and attained Mahasamadhi, leaving his devotees in a flood of unbearable grief. All the wonderful leelas played by Bhagavan when he was in the body make a book all on its own. The same kind of wonderful leelas still occur in the glory of his name. The experiences of his devotees are standing testimonies to that.
Bhagavan declared about his ashram. Those who enter this ashram will never go back empty-handed. My father's blessings are pouring on them like rain. Whether they are aware of it or not, this is the truth. Today, his name, Yogi Ram Sarat Kumar, is a powerful mantra for thousands of people. It gives help, guidance and protection to all those who do japa of his name. His ashram, under the able leadership of Sri Justice, has become a holy sanctuary and a pilgrim center of peace, joy and service to all the devotees. A temple for Bhagavan was built by the efforts of Sri Justice Arunachalam at the birthplace of Bhagavan in Nardara. It is a jewel in the crown of Sir Justice. We the devotees should live in constant remembrance of him by holding on to his feet and his name making our life fruitful. Ever watchful, he blesses his devotees all the time, always living in their hearts. Our Bhagavan is the very life of us, the devotees. His grace undoubtedly reaches out to everyone. Just as Sabari collected, tasted and gave only the best fruits to Sri Rama, let us all remember again and again the varied Leelas of Bhagavan and keep his divine form in our hearts chanting and offering his Namas as flowers at his lotus feet. To the ever gracious Muti, our Bhagavan Sri Yogi Ram Sarutkama, our salutations again and again forever and ever. My father's blessings to all of you. My father blesses all. My father blesses all. This story of Bhagavan Yogiram Sarat Kumar has been adapted from Ma Devikki Mataji's book, Bhagavan in Valke Charidam. We submit our namaskarams to Ma Devikki Mataji, who is dedicated to Guru Seva. We thank all the devotees who are involved in creating this blessed video. Jai Yogiram Sarat Kumar.